Howdy, howdy. So, wanted to do something a little bit different. Uh, I wanted to test out some streaming software that I have, and we're going to see how it uh, how it works out. Um, so, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the title up here, we're going to be talking briefly about uh, the uh, dominant pictures of the 1950s. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because no one really has heard of very many of them. Uh, keep in mind that in the 1950s, that's when TV started becoming very popular, and so that's when... Uh, uh, people really started getting invested in uh, sports teams that weren't not weren't necessarily local teams. It was often the first time that a lot of uh, a lot of people were able to watch teams that weren't from their area, and, and it was for most of America it was their first chance to really watch Major League Baseball at all. And keep in mind that television is a visual media, so what's really a pre what's what's the thing that people really like to see? They really like to see home runs, or they really like to see clever hitting. Uh, the defensive stuff, not so much. It doesn't make as big a deal. You have to do something really ostentatious. You have to do something like uh, pitching a no-hitter in the World Series, or you have to do something like making a, an amazing catch. Uh, but if you think about polo ground uh, series, uh, polo ground uh, big plays, you think more of uh, Bobby Richardson's shot heard around the world than you really think of Willie Mace's over-the-shoulder catch. And so defensive players really didn't make that big of a splash when it came to it. So in the 1950s, there just aren't that many pitchers that we think about nowadays as being the cream of the crop, whereas these hitters of the 1950s, they were terrified of these pitchers. These pitchers were dominant. These pitchers, uh, basically, if you saw this person on the mound, you were going to have a bad day. Another thing to keep in mind is that we don't have the medicine in the 1950s that we do now. So if you blow out your shoulder or if you blow out your elbow, it's pretty much your career. And so a lot of these pitchers, uh, they only had careers that lasted 11 years or 12 years. And once they actually injured themselves, they were kind of limited to uh, a reliever role for their last two or three years uh, playing. So a lot of these pitchers just didn't have the longevity that some of these hitters had, um, with one exception, which we're going to talk about. So what I've got here are 10 pitchers from the 1950s. We're going to go in reverse order by war or wins against replacement. In other words, if you were to replace this pitcher with just anyone uh, off the street, basically, if you uh, any any uh, minor league prospect or draft pick, um, this is how many more wins having this player on your roster would get you as opposed to that minor league prospect or free agent. Um, so, And also keep in mind that when you're talking about pitchers, uh, there just aren't that many opportunities in a game. A uh, hitter may be in 150 different games and a pitcher may be in 40. So the fact that these war numbers are a little bit lower, because we're going to be talking about career war, um, don't let that fool you. These are are really dominant pitchers. And we're going to start with our number 10 on this list. This is Bobby Shands. Uh, Bobby Shands uh, was a pitcher primarily for Philadelphia Athletics and Kansas City Athletics. And that means that he was pitching for a pretty bad team at the time. Uh, throughout the 1950s, the Philadelphia Athletics were one of the uh, worst teams in the American League, routinely finishing either ninth or 10th place. And as a result of that, um, you know, when he did get wins, um, they were few and far between. That being said, though, for his career, uh, he had a 119 and 99 record. His career was a 3.38 ERA, and he made three All Star games. So he was a dominant pitcher of the era. When you had to pitch against the Athletics, you had to watch out that maybe I was going to have to pitch against Bobby Shantz. So um, his uh, wins against replacement for his career was 34.7, which means he was better 34.7 wins for your team over his career. And his best season was 1952. That was the year that he actually won the MVP. And he won the MVP with a 24-7 and record, with a 2.48 ERA, and with 152 strikeouts. And that's something else to keep in mind, is that we're not going to be talking about the amazing strikeout totals like a Nolan Ryan or like a um, just the, the dominant pitchers of the 70s, 80s. We're not going to be talking like a Steve Carlton. We're not going to be talking like a Randy Johnson. So having 150 to 200 strikeouts in a season was dominant back then. Uh, they had to rely on much more uh, varied uh, a range of uh, pitchers. So number 10 on our list, it's Bobby Shands for the Philadelphia Athletics. Number nine, we're going to move to uh, Don Newcomb. Don Newcomb was a pitcher for the Brooklyn and later Los Angeles Dodgers, um, and then later the Cincinnati Red Lakes. Uh, his war was 38.9 for the 1950s, and he had a record of 153 and 96. And so you can see the difference between playing for a dominant team like the Dodgers as opposed to a routinely second division team like uh, the Athletics.
Athletics. So he had a 119 and 99 career record with a 3.38 ERA and uh, excuse me, a 3.57 ERA and four All Star appearances. And his best season was 1956. 1956, he went 27-7. Uh, so that's, that's just amazing. In about 40 games, he got 27 wins uh, with 3.06 ERA and 139 strikeouts. So that's our number nine, Don Newcomb. Number eight, uh, and this one's going to be a little bit of a shocker. It's going to be Bob Friend. Uh, Bob Friend played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and the Pittsburgh Pirates were basically the athletics of the National League. They were routinely in the second division, routinely one of the last uh, teams in the conference. And uh, his record reflects it. He has a 197 and 230 career record uh, because he habitually played for weak hitting teams. He habitually played for teams that were struggling. His wins above replacement is 40.8. Uh, and that's just amazing is the fact that, you know, as bad as the Pirates were, if he wasn't on the team, take 40 wins away over his career. He had a 197 and 230 record. He had a 3.58 ERA. So just one hundredth of a point above uh, Don Newcomb. So he was just as effective as a pitcher as Don Newcomb was. He had three all-star appearances and his best season was 1958. It was one of his few winning seasons where he went 22 and 14 for a team that basically won 50 games that year. Uh, 3.68 ERA, so a little bit above his average with 135 strikeouts. So here's Bob Friend, number eight on our list uh, with uh, 40.8 wins above replacement. Number seven, um, Virgil Trucks. Uh, and of course, I imagine you're looking at some of these names, and, and aside from Don Newcomb, you may have not even heard of any of these players, didn't even know that these players exist. Uh, he has a wins above replacement of 40.5. Uh, his record with Detroit was a 177 and 135 record. Um, so not a bad winning record for, for a team that uh, was dominated by the Yankees, was dominated by the Indians, was dominated by the other upper division teams of the 1950s. Uh, and he had a 3.39 ERA over his career and two all-star appearances. Uh, his best season was 1953. He got went 20-10 and 10 that year uh, with a 2.93 ERA, and he also had 149 strikeouts over that year. So again, a dominant performance, but he was in and out uh, the best pitcher that the Tigers had at the time. So just uh, something to keep in mind. Um, and I mentioned the Indians, but the Indians were probably the second dominant team over the 1950s. And so we're going to talk about a couple of their pitchers here. Uh, one of them is going to be Bob Lemon. Uh, Bob Lemon uh, is a really interesting story. He started pitching before World War II. Actually, he started playing baseball, I should say, before World War II. He was playing in the outfield. And he went to World War II, and he happened to be stationed with other Major League Baseball players. And they were like, hey, why don't you try pitching? So he had never pitched before World War II, and then he comes out of World War II, he suddenly starts pitching, he suddenly starts pitching, he gets goes 207 and 128 over his career with a 3.23 ERA, 48.2 wins above replacement, just a dominant Hall of Fame pitcher, considering that this person did not pitch prior to World War II. Um, you know, a lot of players, they'll be pitching in the Little League, they'll be pitching in high school, they'll be pitching in the minor leagues or in college. This this player had actually gotten to the major leagues as a hitter, as a slugger, um, and then moved over to the pitching position. Um, seven All-Star games for this guy. He's just a dominant pitcher of his era. Uh, 1954 was his best year. He went 23-7. and seven. Uh, That was the year that his team won the pennant, or actually most people don't even say the year that the Indians won the pennant. They say the year that New York Yankees lost the pennant because prior to this, the Yankees had won five straight World Series. Um, so Bob Lemon had a 2.72 ERA that year, also with 110 strikeouts. Again, we're not talking power pitching. We're not talking about fastballs. We're talking about knuckleballs and curveballs, and we're talking about really just finesse pitching. And that's what you'll see with a lot of these pitchers. As a matter of fact, the only real fireballer we have here is probably this next player, Billy Pierce from the Chicago White Sox. Uh, Billy Pierce had a wins above replacement of 53.3, and uh, he went 211 and 169. 
29 for his career with a 3.27 ERA, also had seven All-Star games. And uh, his best season was 1956, where he went 20 and 9 with a 3.26 ERA. Keep in mind, though, that the Chicago White Sox were not one of the dominant teams of the era. As a matter of fact, the White Sox basically were known for being the go-go White Sox, where they basically had one run at the World Series over the entire 1950s. But this guy had 192 strikeouts. He's actually going to have the best season in the 1950s of any pitcher when it comes to strikeouts. So Billy Pierce is our number five guy here. Now, of course, I've mentioned the Indians and I've mentioned the Yankees. So let's go ahead and talk about one of the dominant Yankees pitchers, and that's Whitey Ford. Uh, Whitey Ford had wins above replacement of 57.1, considering that he's a Hall of Fame pitcher. Sorry about that. Considering he's a Hall of Fame pitcher for that period of time, it's just uh, a dominant performance. Whitey Ford actually went to 10 different World Series over his career. He went to eight All-Star games. Had a 236 and 106 uh, win-loss record with a 2.75 ERA over his career. It's just amazing to have a sub-3 ERA for your career. Just dominant. 1955 was his best season, and he was 18-7 and seven for that with a 2.63 ERA. And he only had 137 strikeouts. So, I mean, the thing is, we're talking about all these pitchers of the 1950s, and there's maybe only three or four names that really pop out at people. And this one might be a little surprising as well. This is our number three guy, another Cleveland Indian early win. And you're thinking, who? Well, this who is a Hall of Famer. This who is a 300 game winner. 300 and 244 was his record over his career. Yeah, 544 decisions. That's just astounding. 3.54 ERA, seven All Star games appearances, 61 wins above replacement. He's number three on our list. Just a dominant pitcher for that era. He pitched in the 48 series and the 54 series, and his 54 year was his best year. 54, he went 23 and 11, won a 2.73 ERA, 155 strikeouts. So just uh, another dominant pitcher over this era. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't know this guy. It's just astonishing. Here's a Hall of Famer that a lot of people just have no clue who he is. And he's probably one of the most dominant American League pitchers uh, for the 1950s. And I say that because our other two pitchers are from the National League, and you've probably heard of both of these names, but uh, a lot of people have not heard of or really don't think of Robin Roberts as being a dominant pitcher. Uh, they've heard the name, but a lot of people, when they hear the name, they think of a, of a uh, person on uh, ABC. Um, but Robin Roberts had 86.1 wins above replacement pitching for the uh, Philadelphia Phillies. He went 286 and 245, so just missed the 300 win threshold that a lot of people think of as a Hall of Fame boundary. Uh, 3.41 ERA and seven all-star appearances. Just a, a dominant pitcher over the time. His 1952 season, he won 28 games. He went 28 and seven that year with 148 strikeouts and a 2.59 ERA. So he's our number two for wins above replacement. And, and he really is uh, one of the top pitchers that a lot of people don't think about. And number one on our list, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of, he's probably the best pitcher of the 1950s, uh, and that's Warren Spahn. Now, I say the best pitcher of the 1950s because keep in mind that Bob Feller primarily was a pitcher in the 1940s, and Sandy Koufax was primarily dominant during the 1960s. His 61-66 to 66 run was probably the best six-year run of any pitcher. But Warren Spahn was really the pitcher of the 1950s, pitching for the Boston and later Milwaukee Braves. He has a wins above replacement of 100 100.1, just a dominant uh, pitcher. And part of that is because of his longevity. He actually made 25 seasons. This guy started pitching in 1942, then took three years off for World War II, and then pitched from 1946 to 1965. Just a dominant, dominant career. 363 wins, most wins by a lefty. Uh, for actually most wins by any pitcher whose career is after 1920. So you think about all these, you know, Christy Mathewson and Cy Young, all these people with these really huge numbers, Walter Johnson, these pitchers pitched in a different era. Well, this guy pitched in a good era, the 1950s, and 363 wins, 245 losses for his career, primarily because of his longevity, a 3.09 ERA, 14 All-Star Game appearances. And his best season was 1953. He went 23-7. and seven. He had a 210 ERA. 
ERA and 148 strikeouts. So, I mean, just a dominant pitcher, just dominant across the board. And so, um, what I really wanted to do today is I kind of wanted to talk about all of these uh, pitchers who came across the 1950s and they went up routinely against your Roberto Clemente's and your Jackie Robinson's and your Mickey Mantles and your Duke Snyder's and your Willie Mays and all of your dominant sluggers. And we hear about those dominant sluggers every time. When their baseball cards comes up, they come up in the talks of what's the most expensive baseball card of X year. But we really don't talk about these pitchers that face them year in, year out, and dominated a lot of them, just really were the strong pitching arm that, that dominated those teams. And so I just wanted to bring awareness to that. I wanted to thank you all for watching, and have a great day.